ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends, it's a great pleasure to welcome you here at uh, Queen Mary University of London, together with uh, Rafael Kofitsky. Uh, we are delighted to um, have you for this uh, PO event, uh, first day of the Paris Arbitration Week. Um, we are regularly hosting uh, these uh, Paris Arbitration Week events here at uh, Queen Mary University of London in Paris, um, you might want to ask yourselves why is there a Queen Mary University of London in Paris? <laughs> well, actually more than 10 years ago, we uh, opened this campus and we started with our flagship LLM in dispute resolution, but actually also other uh, specialisms like banking and finance and intellectual property and um, after a lot of years of very successful program running, we also added other specialisms like computer law and legal tech. And we're delighted to welcome here in Paris actually a very international, equally international body of students uh, like in London. And some of them are actually here today and I welcome them particularly warmly as well. Um, so today's event um, is, as you know, about what is wrong with arbitration, a somewhat provocative question um, that we will ask in turn to all of our speakers, and we have an excellent lineup of speaker here. Um, the idea being that arbitration, um, maybe you say is the best suited mechanism, dispute resolution mechanism into the national sphere, yes. But even the best in class can always think about improvements, and that's exactly what we want to do today. Uh, think about what can be improved, and maybe more importantly, how it can be improved. So it's a little bit like if we had a magic wand, and we will pass it on to our speakers, and one by one, they will identify an area of improvement um, uh, they wish to look at. Um, I take this opportunity to tell the people at the back, there's still some seats at the front, you better be quick. Bye. <laughs> so with that, having introduced uh, the topic, uh, let me hand over uh, to Raphael to introduce our uh, wonderful speaker for today's event. Thank you. Thank you, Maxi. And actually, most of our speakers do not really need any introduction, but we will still do an introduction. First, we have Professor Meyer, who is a specialist in international arbitration law and private international law, two subjects he has taught for decades at the University of Paris 1, Panthéon Sorbonne, where he was a professor from 1984 to 2012. And both Maxi and I were his students, and we're very proud of that. He has acted as arbitrator and counsel in hundreds of commercial and investment treaty based proceedings on a variety of ad hoc and institutional arbitration rules. He is one of the most highly regarded arbitration practitioners in France and is routinely acclaimed as one of the best arbitrators in the world. He's the former president of International Academy of Arbitration Law, member of the Council of the IC Institute of World Business Law, member of the board of the Comité Français de l'Arbitrage, member of the Institut de Droit International, and former president of the Committee on International Commercial Arbitration of the International Law Association. Uh, most interestingly, uh, Pierre knows the best Jewish jokes that he will generally uh, share with you during the wine and cheese reception, preferably after a drink or two. Uh, next to Maxi is Karl Ennessy. Karl Ennessy is the Senior Vice President of Litigation, Investigation and Regulatory Affairs at Airbus, where he leads the group's global activities in these areas. Separately, he sits as arbitrator and serves as the board of directors of companies and nonprofits. Until July 2019, he also served as chairman of the governing body of the IC Court of International Arbitration and is now a member of the ECAB Board of Directors, the IBM Mediation Committee, and the HKIC Council, as well as its Proceedings Committee. He also serves on the Advisory Council for the School of International Arbitration at Queen Mary University of London. Diamana Diawaha. Diamana is the International Chamber of Commerce Director for Dispute Resolution Services in Africa. She took on this role in January 2021 after leading for five years the case management team of the Secretariat of the ICC Court, overseeing disputes involving parties from the Middle East, Africa, and Francophone Europe. 
As regional director for Africa, Yamana focuses on strengthening the dispute resolution infrastructure on the African continent by offering capacity building opportunities to practitioners in a region and by leading initiatives among aiming at increasing the participation of African practitioners in the international arbitration scene. Diamana has a passion for children's literature, and for Disney's in particular, and loves spending hours cooking while listening to legal podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> ben Juratovic, who is at the very end of this table, is widely recognized as, and of course my iPad leaves me here, uh, as, <laughs> damn it, widely recognized as an outstanding advocate. Uh, he serves as counsel before international courts and tribunals in disputes between states, disputes between foreign investors and states, and disputes between commercial parties. He appears before domestic courts in cases involving international law or international arbitration. The legal directory Chambers and Partners has, on the basis of feedback from clients, described Ben as having an outstanding ability to communicate complex legal arguments with conceptual clarity and persuasiveness as combining high-level legal expertise with strategic and innovative approach. Fun fact, when Ben was nine years old, he had the lead role in a bicycle safety film. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot to mention that Ben Dretovich is a barrister, he's a king's counsel today at Essex Court. Without further ado, we will now move on to our discussion. And the first question we would like to ask to Carl is what problems do, do you identify? Why do you identify problems with arbitrator selection? And what solutions do you propose? Thank you. Uh, thank you for that introduction. And thank you to the Queen Mary University for having us all here today. I think it's delightful to see how many of you have turned up in person. And uh, I only hope that uh, you will be as challenging to us as we deserve uh, when we take on this controversial topic. Uh, there are many panels uh, that you do that you forget about quickly. I don't think I'll ever forget this one because I genuinely enjoyed debating with my colleagues here what's really wrong with arbitration. And I submit to you that the single worst thing about the many things that we need to fix is the manner in which arbitrators are selected. Call them arbitrator whisperers. Call them tribunal magicians. Call them the conjurers of the secret mind of the arbitrator. But all of us are guilty in one way or another to, go to contributing to this problem. And the problem is this. When we select a tribunal, the one thing that we should be focused on is a fair and just result. That is the last thing that I am counseled on by the various people who play a role in my own selection. It's the last thing that I unfortunately think of when I approach this problem. It is the last thing on the minds of the institutions when they select this. And unfortunately, the arbitrators so selected feel that very strongly in a competitive environment. Yes, the selection of arbitrators is a competitive environment. Put all of those things together and you have a toxic mix. Why? Because if you are focused from the outset on the selection of an arbitrator who has some kind of intellectual bias, some kind of superior advantage to the, uh, with respect to your case, you are not focused on some of the other things, including some of the risks you may be taking by relying on that kind of advice, by relying on the ability of your conjurer, your witch, your wizard, or your magician to speak into the ear a secret language which only your tribunal will understand. Why is this a problem? Well, it's a problem because it distracts from what we really should be doing, which is trying to simplify as much as we can the submissions so that they can be understood, read, interpreted, and ruled upon by a tribunal that is fair-minded. If you start with the idea that you are trying to seek an advantage, let me tell you how this works. The claimant is advised, and most claimants are not as sophisticated as they need to be to push back on this, and even if they dare to push back on it, they are going against the advice of their counsel in doing so, that they need an arbitrator who is probably more qualified than is really required for the dispute at hand. This in turn sets off an arms race. The respondent receives the name of the claimant's arbitrator, and if failing to knock out the arbitrator because the assumption is always the same, they've selected that individual because he or she is biased in favor of their position, let us find someone even more senior who is even more biased in favor of our position. Not biased in the sense of the IBA rules, not biased in the sense of red or yellow or pink lists, but biased in the sense that they will be intellectually predisposed to ignore our position, which we have not fully yet disclosed. This culminates 
in the top of the arms race in a multi, if we're talking about a multi-member tribunal, uh, with a president who is even more qualified than the two individuals who have combined to select. And generally what you end up with in three-member tribunals is a total tribunal that is too qualified, too busy, and not diverse enough. I will come back to the D word because it's truly the only thing that matters. That having then been accomplished, let me take on the institutions. The institutions come under pressure, and this is in the case of selection of, single, of sole arbitrators uh, in particular. We can talk about the problems of party joint selection of sole arbitrators as well, but I'll focus on the institutions because they deserve some blame here too. They come under enormous <laughs> pressure. Oh, absolutely. You take this on. Yeah, I know you agree with me. Uh, the institutions take on the responsibility of trying to satisfy the demands of both parties who in submissions about the qualities needed by the arbitrator are trying to find someone who is basically half goat, half pig, half swan, half unicorn, and half something else. And therefore are under pressure to try to select people again that are probably not right the right fit, but will avoid the uh, negative impression created by not selecting the half unicorn. There is one and only one marker that is truly, truly, truly in all of the experience I have, and I think in all the literature I've read, a marker of success in the selection of a tribunal, and that is diversity. Science will tell you something very interesting. If you pick a random group of uh, diverse people, diverse points of view, diverse backgrounds, etc., you will get a better result in even a, fact a problem with a factually correct answer. Let's take the example that certain neuroscientists often use, which is how many pennies are there in a large jar? It's a game you've all played at some carnival or fair or something like it. A group of accountants and a group of mathematicians will do a worse job of estimating the number of pennies in a jar than a, a group composed of a grocery clerk, an artist, a lawyer, an arbitrator, and whatever you take. Diversity is the only thing that works. So my plea to the institutions, to you, to myself, when I'm at the point of selecting, is do not listen to the conjurers, do not listen to the arbitration whisperers. Focus on the one thing that matters. Get a quicker result, get a fair result, get a faster, re a faster and less expensive result, and for God's sake, let's stop the arms race. It doesn't work. <laughs> Demona, I think you wanted to react on the issue of diversity. And the institutions. And the institutions. <laughs> and I will start with the institutions. Uh, yes, institutions tend to look for what we call in French, the mouton à pas. The reason why institutions do that, however, is precisely because we know how parties will react to our exotic choices in appointment of arbitrators and in trying to satisfy the party's uh, expectations, we end up, and you are perfectly correct there, Carl, uh, selecting somebody that sometimes might not actually fit the bill properly in terms of the mission that is at heart, but rather try to find someone that will please everybody around the table. Now, to add on what you were saying with respect to diversity, uh, uh, and, and I obviously fully agree with the point with respect to uh, the fact that you get a better result when it comes from people with diverse background. I would say that uh, uh, international arbitration, uh, like many other industries, but more specifically ours, is absolutely distorted when it comes to who makes the decision versus who is uh, who are those concerned by the decision. And if you look, we were hearing this morning the keynote speech of uh, the Paris Arbitration Week kickoff from uh, Yas Banifatemi, who was very rightfully pointing to the fact that most of the cases in arbitration decided in investment arbitration, but that is also true to some extent in commercial arbitration, will have an element that has to do with uh, Latin America, uh, Asia, Africa, and yet, most of the practitioners deciding those cases are from Western Europe. And there, in terms of diversifying, the point is not so much a question of, uh, you know, uh, diversifying just for the sake of it. It's also a matter of business and being business-minded. We need to understand in our, our industry that those people uh, who are, uh, who those e economic operators whose disputes come to arbitration at some point will want some reflection of their identity, of their culture in 
the decision making process and not just because it's right but also because your decision is more accurate if you understand the local context if you understand the local laws that i won't even get to that but you also understand what the parties are facing and after all arbitration uh, is uh, because arbitration offers uh, a dispute resolution mechanism with people specifically dedicated for the parties to that uh, industry at stake in a particular dispute, we should actually, in our way of selecting our arbitrators, be minded that the arbitrators, if we're talking about that group, uh, look and understand the issues of those parties that are involved in the, in the arbitrations. So obviously, diversity is something that we need to strive, continue striving for. Uh, I know that not everyone uh, sees the point or understand the point about diversity. Mostly, I think, uh, and there's no accusation there, but I think obviously when you are part of a majority, it's more difficult to understand what uh, those in the minority are trying to convey as a point. Obviously, if you are, uh, again, no accusation, but if you are a white man uh, of a certain age and you've been practicing arbitration for a long time, you will not see the problem with diversity. You will feel that, after all, what we're looking for are people well-informed who understand, who are skilled, understand the issues in dispute and are able to make an informed decision. Uh, that is one perspective, but we're not saying that a person with that background is not suited for a case that would come out of the ranks of uh, uh, outside of a country outside of Western Europe. What we're saying is maybe somebody else with a different background would fit the bill as well. And that's what diversity is about. So on that, I will rest here because I know we have or Yes, I think we're moving to just one. Oh. I was uh, just asking whether there were further reactions, but of course Pierre has one. <laughs> very short one. As a white man of a certain age, <laughs> I must say that I totally agree with what Diamana Diamana has said uh, on diversity. Thank you. I can already see some reactions in the public, and I would just ask you to hold off with your <laughs> comments and questions, of which I'm sure there will be many, because this is quite a thought-provoking uh, stuff. Um, there will be there will be time for Q and A at the end, but let's hear the other topics uh, from our speakers that they would identify. So I'll pass on the magical wand to Ben. Then, so we heard about the arbitration selection process. Now let's turn to the actual arbitral process. Ben, what would you improve and how? Thank you very much, Maxi, both for the question and to you and Raphael for hosting us. Uh, I think there's too much. I don't mean that there's too much arbitration. I mean that in most arbitrations, there's too much within the arbitration and we need to seriously think about ways to making things more efficient. I'll try to tackle that as briefly as I can, which seems appropriate for the topic, uh, but under uh, four headings. And in, under the general heading of too much, the thing about too much is it works both in English and French, of course, because the French just say too much uh, and, and copy the English. But on the four uh, subheadings, the first one is what is the problem specifically? Written submissions, if you tally up first round, second round uh, of both parties and post-hearing briefs, sometimes two post-hearing briefs, in pretty ordinary cases, there is often more than a thousand pages of written submissions uh, tallied up. Witness statements, hundreds of pages of witness statements and exhibits to witness statements tallied up. Expert reports, not uncommon to have two 200-page expert, 200 expert reports, 250-page replies, and then running into the thousands of pages of exhibits and tables. Uh, and so we've reached a stage where most counsel, most arbitrators, and most parties simply can't absorb or understand the amount that is submitted in most arbitrations, even those who benefit from photographic memories, I'm told, are starting to receive those emails indicating that their storage capacity is full. <laughs> so that's the problem. 
Uh, why is that a problem? Obviously, it's more difficult to identify and focus on the issues that actually matter. The amount of time taken by council to prepare submissions is obviously inordinately longer. The amount of time taken by arbitrators to reach their decisions after having processed the information, knowing that there's a microscope on them in terms of due process, is inordinately longer. And that leads to frustration for everybody, parties, arbitrators, council, and I'd add judges, because in domestic challenge proceedings, of which there are also more and more, the whole record gets put before the court, which means it's all gone through another time, which is frustrating for judges too. That means challenges, not just in terms of time spent, but also for the well-being of everybody involved. And that has consequences for the retention of younger members of the profession and for the ability to have a diverse group of people working in the field, including because those with caring responsibilities simply find it an unwelcome and unsupportable burden to be dealing with this volume of material. Appearances sometimes count, and appearances of fairness and efficiency are also affected. So that's why it's a problem. How did it become such a problem? I think the, the original sin of arbitration is leaving so much to the parties. The idea is that the arbitration is to be driven by the parties and they're the masters of their own destiny. And then when you add on to that the council uh, that they select, there's perfectionism. Sometimes it's perfectionism given what is at stake, but sometimes it's perfectionism for its own sake. Uh, I'd add to that, junior lawyers are driving significant parts of the process and are, be and are being left by those with an economic interest in them driving much of the process without necessarily being able to make the judgment calls that are necessary as to what to leave out or even if they do have the inherent judgment skills to know what should be left out, aren't necessarily in a position where they're confident enough to implement their own judgment. I would add that I think as much as things becoming electronic is great, it also means that there's effectively an inexhaustible capacity to store and distribute material, which means there's no practical physical check on what can be submitted. There's another point, which is that hours, when, when lawyers are working on hourly rates, there is no economic incentive for them to work less. We all know that, but it's, it's a problem. And if lawyers are busy enough, it shouldn't be a problem. But if they're working in a team with other people in it who aren't busy enough, the economic incentive in, continues to be perverse. So the most important point, and the point Maxi encouraged us to think about, how could matters be improved. First of all, uh, more discipline from council to just say there is just too much and this needs to stop. There needs to first be a recognition of the problem. Uh, secondly, more involvement of experienced council earlier in the process, whether of their own volition or prompted by their more junior colleagues, to make decisions about what to leave out and what can sensibly be left out. That's counsel. Arbitrators are not without blame. There needs to be, in my view, more active case management by arbitrators early in the process and throughout the process. When it comes to document disclosure, for example. Most arbitrators at that stage are learning something about the case because they need to do so in order to make document production orders. But then it's as though that's put back in the vault and then the parties just go on doing whatever they like until it gets to the hearing. And there must be a good argument for arbitrators to show a firmer hand earlier on to identify what is and isn't relevant and what they would and wouldn't welcome uh, evidence and submissions on. And on that, the use of issue lists might be quite useful. Uh, that at an appropriate stage, not necessarily the very beginning, there should be a common issue list settled where there's dispute by the arbitrators and people then need to stick to the issue list, both in terms of argument and in terms of evidence. 
identifying whether types of witnesses, whether fact or expert, are really necessary. Uh, there are so many expert reports that go in that actually just don't matter at all and nothing turns on them. Uh, and so there, there must be a case for arbitrators saying early on, if you want to put in expert evidence, then you need to identify why expert evidence on that subject is necessary and convince me. And if arbitrators aren't convinced, then there shouldn't be expert evidence on that topic. Uh, page limits. The International Court of Justice recently introduced page limits not just for submissions, but also for annexes or exhibits. Uh, 750 pages in that case. I'm not saying that's right for every case. <laughs> 750 pages for all uh, exhibits in all rounds of pleadings total. Uh, and the page number might be different for different cases, but it's at least got to be thought about and discussed, uh, even if necessary, to review it over time. Is it really necessary to have two rounds of written submissions in every case? Aren't there some cases where there could be just one? And are PHBs really necessary? Are they really adding that much after a two-week hearing? And even if there was a short pause, wouldn't an oral closing actually be more helpful? Scheduling time in procedural orders for the tribunal to meet as the case proceeds, so the arbitrators are communicating with each other as the case proceeds to make the process more efficient, and arbitrators scheduling time for deliberations as they go and immediately <coughs> after the hearing. But before I am accused of being inefficient, I'm going to stop. <laughs> Well, thank you, thank, thank, thanks for the organizers to have in, invited me. Um, I must say that among the people at this table, the only one who was not one of my students is precisely the <laughs> But I have witnessed that in spite of that, he is really outstanding <laughs> as, uh, as counsel, for instance, and also as a speaker, as you've just heard. So I necessarily agree with him uh, that the problem he's this, he has described is really a burning problem uh, in, uh, well, in my experience. In most arbitrations, it's too voluminous, too long, too, takes too, too much time, and too costly for the, for the parties. Uh, and I also agree with the causes that he has identified, especially uh, the council proactivism, uh, which may be due maybe because uh, they sincerely believe that writing 300 pages is always better than writing 150. And uh, uh, disclosing um, maybe uh, 700 documents is better than only uh, 100. Uh, that's a possibility, in which case they are wrong, in which case they're wrong, as Ben has said. Uh, the other possibility, which also Ben has mentioned, is that it will maximize their fees. So, in fact, the system has drifted. 20 years ago, 30 years ago, the memorials were much shorter. There were less documents, not so many witnesses, etc. Uh, and it's very difficult to, to put a heart with, to that. And uh, I agree with most of what uh, Ben has said about the remedies. I have two areas in which you know, there may be discussion, let's say. Uh, first, there should be more discipline uh, in council working. But that's absolutely true. But it's more or less wishful thinking, because they don't want to uh, deliver a, a memorial of only 100 pages. Uh, it's better to have 300 for one reason or for another one. Uh, maybe, but I said maybe, uh, in-house counsel should play a role because 
they go to uh, conferences, they listen to Ben Jaratovic and, and others saying the same thing, it's much too long, too costly, etc., too voluminous. So we know that. Please counsel their counsel. Uh, not so many pages. Shorter briefs, please. Uh, not, not for witnesses to uh, establish the same facts, etc., etc. Now, now that may also be wishful thinking, because maybe they are uncertain that they are right, and maybe they think that the council know better, uh, or they are intimidated. I am saying they should not. They should not. I think it's at this point, at this place, the remedy may exist. At other places, I'm skeptical. And that goes also for arbitrators. Because saying that arbitrators should be more proactive, well, they should take initiatives that should not simply uh, read the memorials when they come or when the last one comes, etc. That's perfectly true. But um, the task for an arbitrator to impose his or her view is not so obvious. Um, an arbitral tribunal is not a court. A court has a legitimate authority because it's the public service of justice which is made at the disposal, put at the disposal of the public, of the litigants, and also the number of judges is limited in each country. So they have to manage that and they have authority. And also there are public officers. Uh, in arbitration, the well, first it the first it's the party's case, as the English like to say. It's the party's case, not the arbitrator's case. Uh, also, they are the ones who pay the cost, and so they want to have their view of the way the position of their client must be presented, um, and. Uh, if, for instance, the tribunal says at the beginning, uh, we consider that in this case they know already the request for arbitration and the answer, um, statements of claim, the statement of claim and the statement of defense must be no more than 100 pages long. Well, the counsel for claimant, for instance, will rise indignant and will say, I know the case. You don't know it yet. Uh, my estimate is that this case is extremely complex and I want to explain it fully and I need more than 100 pages. And what do you do in that case? I mean, it's a legitimate reaction in my opinion. Um, now, when the case is more advanced and the tribunal knows better and obviously at the stage of pre-hearing breach, post, sorry, post-hearing briefs, then the tribunal knows the case very well and can limit the number of pages, then that, and that is what is currently uh, done. Um, I think I've spoken too long, so <laughs> I have a third point. No, go ahead. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'm not going to limit your points, Pierre. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, on the uh, list of issues, I would say not, uh, although that's in the ICC uh, rules, not at the beginning. I've had a terrible experience with that. We spent a whole day uh, drafting the terms of reference, including the list of issues, and we did not succeed because it's sometimes extremely difficult because you always have to distinguish supposing the answer is this or supposing the answer is that. And if it is this, then etc. etc. So it's a whole tree uh, which is sometimes, and parties disagreeing, very, very difficult to establish. Now, when you come to the next phase, for instance, after the first exchange of memorials, it becomes more, it becomes easier. That's all I, I wanted to say. Yeah. I think I have some quick ideas. I always do. Yeah. 
To my fellow in-house counsel, I think that uh, Ben and Pierre have mentioned two things that I recognize. Uh, the first principle is something called accidental extortion. So those with whom we deal, uh, especially in advisory capacity, are happy to listen to us when we tell them that we really don't think that this memorial should be more than 50 pages, because into the hundreds is nuts. Uh, and But we're always told, yes, but, well, you know, if, if you're wrong about that, and it turns out that this decisive uh, paragraph has been cut, or this decisive annex has not been submitted, then of course you'll have to tell the board that that was your idea, <laughs> which is a difficult thing to do. Uh, ben made the point about the fees, and Pierre, you've endorsed it. The simple answer to that is, why would you anybody pay hourly fees in this day and age? If you have sufficient expertise, and I think we all do, every person in this room does, Everyone understands one thing, the approximate value of any given dispute is 10% of the claim. So why on earth would anybody still be paying hourly fees? I don't. You shouldn't either. Don't do it. Don't create that economic incentive. If you do, it is your problem. Every economist will tell you that if you created the behavioral incentive, you eat the result of the behavior. To counsel, those of you who think that you're going to get repeat business and you should be focused on repeat business, not on maximizing the value of any single claim, you should recognize that your the economic value of your relationship will be greater if you deliver value service rather than expensive one-time service. So the accidental extortion point plays for you as well. Two tribunals. Uh, there are two points to which I think I can respond to endorsing what Pierre said. The first is something called Parkinson's Law. Parkinson isn't a disease. Uh, Parkinson, in this case, is a neuroscientist who understood that work will fill the space you make for it. So in other words, if you set a 30-page page limit, it will be tightly drafted, clean text that is easy to read. George Bernard Shaw, for those of you who prefer literature, he said, I wrote you a long letter because I didn't have time to write you a short one. <laughs> Take the time to write the short letter. It'll be better for everyone. The second point to the tribunal is, I think there's room for a conversation at the outset of any uh, arbitration about how activists you would like your tribunal to be. Tribunals have a certain moral suasive of power at the beginning and certainly at the outset. If they have the conversation with the parties, how active would you like me to manage this case? What role do you, should, I, should interim costs award be playing? I think you'll find that at the outset, the parties will embrace that idea nearly universally. To institutions. Please, 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 let's follow, though we do not necessarily choose to go to state courts, let's follow the example of some of the things state courts are doing. Let's have more robust, more aggressive preliminary or early disposition procedures. That is still quite rare, and it's something I'd like to see more of. And let's please, please, please get much more aggressive in what can be and should be included in uh, expedited proceedings. I love the 2017 rules, and I love the fact that they include an expedited for the ICC that's certainly not present in most rules as well. But the threshold is too damn low, and there are far too few cases which are adopted on a discretionary basis. There are extraordinary counterexamples. I believe the highest uh, number for an ICC case is in the 130 million range. I personally have litigated one in, a, in an expedited proceeding that was worth 75 million. Let's do more. Let's do a lot more of that. What I really like about this is that usually you have this sort of uh, blame game going on that everyone, the institutions, blame counsel, counsel play arbitrators, arbitrators blame parties and so forth and so on. And here everyone got its or his or her share. You all know what to do to yeah. make it better. I really like that. Thank you so much. Jemana, we'd like to turn to another problem you've identified with arbitration, which is due process paranoia. Indeed. Would you mind sharing your thoughts on this? My pleasure, and thank you again for having me. And you know, when uh, Maxi and Raphael uh, invited me to speak on what's wrong with arbitration, there was a very long list of points that came to my mind, uh, having been with an institution for a decade now. Uh, but what really stuck was due process paranoia. And what is it that we call due process paranoia? It's, I would define it as a, a very problematic disease that affects uh, prominently arbitrators with multiple fears to the uh, the root of that uh, that disease, the fear of the award being challenged due to a violation of rights of one of the parties, uh, the f fear of increased threats to the arbitrator's uh, seat as an arbitrator being challenged during the life of the case, and 
the fear more difficult to admit of not receiving future appointments. Now, when I was looking into whether there is literature about that specific issue, I read this very interesting definition by Rémi Gerbet on due process paranoia that he defines with three elements. Uh, one or more case management decisions often made to protect the interest of the respondent party. Second element, the arbitral, the arbitral tribunal's belief that such caution is necessitated by the risk that its decision will otherwise be annulled. And third and last uh, element to identify due process paranoia, the arbitral tribunal's erroneous belief that this degree of caution is warranted. Now in practice, how does due process paranoia translate? That disease, that chronic disease, I should call it, uh, that affects arbitral tribunals uh, will manifest by an arbitral tribunal granting repeated extensions of time to a, request, to a party requesting them, uh, accepting multiple amendments to a party submissions or accepting a party's request to file redundant submissions, accepting the late introduction of new defenses or claims by a party or new evidence, despite the fact that most rules, at least in institutional arbitration, would have a cutoff uh, during the proceedings for introduction of new claims, granting last-minute requests to postpone hearings, that is a, a classic in the due process paranoia, uh, and granting, of course, lengthy disclosure orders. We've, we've heard Ben uh, and Pierre uh, tell us a little bit about the length of the submissions. Now. Why is due process paranoia in and of itself a problem? What's the impact of that due process paranoia? Uh, the issue, the biggest issue here is, of course, uh, the cost and the length of the procedure. And when we hear that arbitration is costly and lengthy, uh, I believe that if we took the time to analyze where that cost and time is spent, a lot would be related to uh, the fact that arbitral tribunals can sometimes be overly cautious with the parties in limiting them in their behaviors. Uh, another impact, of course, of that due process paranoia is the dissatisfaction, uh, which will grow between uh, among the parties, uh, particularly that which will be usually on the claimant side for those multiple or lenient uh, grants of uh, uh, extension of times, of additional claims to the party uh, playing the guerrilla tactics, if we want to call them like that. Of course, the due process paranoia comes from somewhere. It's not only looking at uh, the party uh, wanting to receive new future appointments. The truth is, and we notice that from institutional perspective, you will see greater paranoia in those cases where you have a non-participating respondent. This is the typical case where the arbitral tribunal will be overly cautious. And if I have to take the blame as institution, the truth is also that as institutions in those cases, we will push the tribunal to be overly cautious. However, what we know is that when looking at uh, the national court decisions is that these situations quite rarely would lead to the annulment of an award. And that raises the question of then why do we continue with that be behavior and how to deal with it. It seems that this disease is not entirely impossible to cure. I would even say that we do hold uh, the, the, some of the ingredients that can allow us to get out of that situation. And we've seen over the years a number of professional conduct codification, I would say, of professional uh, guidelines for arbitrators in order to help them get control of the proceedings. Let's start with arbitration rules. If you take proceedings, uh, rules of arbitration like those of ICC, the first duty of the arbitral tribunal, of course, is to render an enforceable award, but in doing so, to conduct the proceedings in an efficient and speedy manner. Of course, with respect, with, with having regard to both parties with respect to, and respecting due process, but the role of the arbitral tribunal is to hold the reins of the proceedings, and I think more tribunals should bear that in mind when taking on the mission. We also see a number of guidelines from different societies, the International Law Associations, uh, Committee on International Commercial Arbitration issued a report that distinguishes between implied and inherent powers of arbitrators, which can guide arbitrators in what they can 
or cannot do and what they should feel comfortable or not to do. Uh, in, this, in, the, in, a, in the same vein, uh, the general guidelines for parties legal representative annexed to the LCIA rules codify the arbitrator's powers when faced with counsel misconduct. Arbitrators generally could also afford to be more robust in their case management style and should not feel hamstrung by the uh, due process paranoia. Uh, they should keep control of the proceedings. They should seek a balance between expeditiousness effective and effectiveness and, of course, not succumb to any pressure or threats from the parties. Often the fear of challenge comes as one of the elements that arbitrators would put forward to explain why they would give a respondent party additional time or allow them to file a claim that ultimately will be actually rejected in the final award. However, arbitrators should feel comfortable, at least in institutional arbitration, that those challenges will most likely not prosper. When you look at the ICC court data, most challenges that are filed on the basis of procedural decisions of arbitral tribunals are rejected by the ICC court. The fact that a party might file a challenge does not mean that that challenge is warranted. And arbitral tribunals should have that in mind when they are way too often lenient to a party by fear that that party would uh, raise that behavior against them in the proceedings. Now, these are some of the elements that we could look at to uh, make sure that due process paranoia is reduced to the minimum. Uh, that being said, and I will stop on this, the truth is that arbitrators may also try try and feel the need to please party, and I will stop on that very controversial point, but they also might feel the need to please parties uh, in pursuing uh, a chance to be appointed in a future case. And that begs the question of, uh, you know, the, the very system of the arbitration and the, way, the fact that the parties are choosing their arbitrators. I am not suggesting here that it's time for us to uh, revise the entire system and, and get uh, the almighty institutions to appoint all arbitrators. But the truth is that uh, it's very difficult to speak in the hand that fits you. Uh, and I will stop here. Ben, uh, I think you, you had some reactions. Thank you very much, Raphael, and most of all, thank you very much to Diamana. Uh, she mentioned the word fear, and it's a very important word, I think. Uh, Pierre made the point that arbitral tribunals are not a court and they're not invested with judicial authority. That's, of course, true. If I'd know, as I would know even better had I been one of his students. Um, but but uh, everything's, everything's relative. Due process is important. If it gets to the stage of due process paranoia, of course it's not. Now, Dimon made the very important point that empirically, domestic courts in serious arbitral seats very rarely annul arbitral awards at all, and certainly not on the basis of due process. And it's, it's linked, in my view, to the point Pierre was making about arbitral tribunals not being invested with authority. That's true then not, except by the domestic arbitration statute and the contract of the parties. And one of the things that they're empowered to do by that contract under that statutory framework is to resolve disputes efficiently. And they have both a right and an obligation to do so. And so my plea as counsel is for arbitrators to exercise that right and comply with that duty more often and more rigorously. And when it comes to Diamana's point about I think she said spitting in the hand that feeds you, which is a terrifying metaphor. <laughs> but, um, That's what we say in Suniki. Yeah. <laughs> but, but when it comes to the concern about repeat appointments, so far as I'm concerned, I would much rather reappoint an arbitrator who takes a robust approach to a sensible process and get things moving 
even if a particularly irritating respondent then, then challenges them, almost certainly unsuccessfully, rather than an arbitrator who bends over backwards to accommodate ridiculous procedural demands. Uh, and so coming back to the point of due process being important, it obviously is, and to perform a fair function of resolving a dispute in accordance with law, it's obviously important to be very serious about due process. The problem is when it reaches the stage of paranoia, uh, and I'm sorry to say that I, I do agree with Diamana that in many circumstances now, before many tribunals, we're too far towards that end of the scale. Kim okay, or Carl? Um, I, I agree. I agree with Diamana that um, due process paranoia, paranoia in, in itself is a bad, very bad thing, and fear should not dictate our behavior. Um, but for me, the problem is somewhere else. Um, the task of arbitrating is a very difficult task because you must have authority and you must also have an open mind. And so uh, you must not, of course, uh, grant uh, 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 additional time limit uh, which is not justified just to please the person and because it says, if I don't get that time, uh, I'm, it's not due process, so I will challenge your, your award. No, of course, you must be just in each case. And for instance, um, if, uh, uh, Council for one party who should uh, submit uh, the memorial on a certain date, a few days before says, well, I'm sorry, but for such and such reason, I need three more days. It's better to grant the three days than to have a memorial which, is, which should not be satisfactory. So I think costs, length, etc. That's very important, but the quality of the decision of the award is even more important. Thank you. Bye. I would just share with you one anecdote which I think does illustrate a power that tribunals clearly do have. And it doesn't come from arbitration, it comes from the hard elbowed world of uh, US litigation. So on one Monday morning, we received an email from the magistrate judge who said that uh, he identified 45 individual issues on which the parties could not agree for, on procedural reasons, ranging from disclosure to certain deadlines. And he said he would hear us in his chambers on Thursday morning, uh, and he would give us two minutes each uh, to present our side of the story, 90 minutes total on 45 issues, and that he would proceed to make a ruling and would award costs against the party um, for whom the ruling was against. Um, there were zero issues by Wednesday night. <laughs> no, no, if you wanted to react immediately. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> we we want to have a discussion, so as many comments as possible. Um, we're going to get to the Q&A, um, just one more uh, final uh, topic. And, and if I might just uh, react to uh, what has been said, Yanama mentioned uh, Rémi Gerbet's article, actually, in the de definition of due process paranoia. If anyone ever has the fear of falling into the trap of due process paranoia, I strongly recommend that you do read that article, yeah. because there you get exactly what Ben said, the empirical analysis that that paranoia is never going to be um, needed to have and that challenges because of due process are unsuccessful. It's very robust empirical evidence in that article. So uh, Rémi Gervais, of course, is one of my colleagues at Queen Mary. Um, so last but not least, uh, Pierre, we've already heard you on a number of uh, comments before. Is there maybe one final item you wanted to add to our list of improvement areas? Well, there's um, one item uh, which I would call excessive standardization of arbitral procedure, but with a question mark, with a question mark. Um, a, a, crit a criticism has very often been raised 
against the fact that now in every arbitration we have exactly the same model, we follow the same steps. Uh, one first exchange of memorials, then uh, maybe a request for production of documents, then a second uh, exchange, etc., etc. Um, that standardization does exist. It's a creation of practice because at the beginning there's no rule at all on how to conduct arbitral proceedings. But during, let's say, 100 years, which is the age of the ICC court, um, arbitrators and counsel coming from various parts of the world uh, have been confronted to the same problems. And so they have invented the rules which were in existence. Um, and they created a model which is a mixture of civil law procedure and common law procedure and maybe other um, uh, sources. Um, and that model appears in, in most arbitrations, at least that I see, uh, in the form of procedural order number one, in which you have all the rules. Um, and uh, that these procedural orders number one very much look alike because they circulate and you receive or you, you get to know in a case as counsel or as co-arbitrator a certain procedural order number one. You like it, there's something you had not thought about, you add it to your model and and it will and your model will circulate also. So all that uh, reinforces the, the consensus of, of the model with slight variations, and also the model becomes more and more elaborate, more and more pages. Um, for instance, uh, the ICSID, because the institutions sometimes have their own model. The ICSID has its own model with its true uh, choices left open at various places. Um, well, it's not universal when I say we, we see it everywhere. It's, it's, we, um, for instance, the LCIA, in ILCIA uh, arbitration, there is a default model, which is the English style. It's quite different from the rest. Uh, but you can, uh, it's default, so you, you can say, no, I don't want that. I, I want my model, the one I, I use in every arbitration, other than even in, with LCIA. <laughs> Now, that criticism has two aspects, I think. First, lack of ad adaptability. Because, um, as you said, as I said at the beginning, you have no rule at all. And so, each case being different, you may adapt the rules uh, governing the proceedings to the specifics of your case, because um, arbitration concerns all fields of law. Uh, the seat is all the countries in the world, or many countries in the world, let's see, at least. Um, people coming from various origins. Um, um, the different nationalities, different laws, uh, etc. So, why invent a kind of code of civil procedure, because that's what the procedural order number one is. Of course, state courts have their own code of civil procedure, 1,000 or 2,000 articles. We have the chance not to have a code imposed on us. And so why come and, and uh, fall into that rut? The rut that, that word has been uh, used in French, in fact, ornière by Emmanuel Gaillard. We are all in an ornier. Um, so that's the first criticism. The second one is it burdening this creation of a model has burdened the procedure. Uh, because the system borrows both from common law and, and civil law, and that leads to some duplication. For instance, you have now long memorials, which is rather the civil law style. Uh, but you have also long hearings, which come from the common law. You have 
documents. In civil law, we like documents more than witnesses. So you have tons of documents. But you also have a lot of witnesses, which have to be examined. Uh, you have oral arguments at the hearing, but you have also, very often, in addition, post-hearing briefs, and maybe two, two uh, rounds of post-hearing briefs. So um, that's the origin of the, the nature of the criticism. And there is some truth in it, I must say. And uh, I think that the model uh, must not be applied blindly. And I observe that there are recently some uh, variations that were not introduced. You had something rather rigid, for instance, the production of documents had to be after the first round of uh, uh, memorials and before the, before the second. Well, now you realize that it's not necessary. First, you don't always need to have a request for production of documents. It depends on the case. And second, if you need one, maybe, for instance, at the very beginning, the claimant cannot draft uh, the statement of claim without getting some documents from the other party. So it's more complex. And, and you must adapt yourself to the situation. Um, also, uh, yes. But now I come to the reason for the question mark. Because it's a problem, but maybe there are not on, only drawbacks. There may be advantages in the problem, in the uh, system that we have. Uh, the model has its merits. It's the result of a cross-fertilization between two uh, previous models, very different from each other. And practitioners have taken the best from each. Um, and so in my opinion, through the time, the model has constantly improved. I think what we have is rather good, even if it must not be rigid. Uh, for example, we have no complete memorials. It, they must not be 300 pages long. But the idea that it's in the form of a detailed reasoning from A to Z, with reference to witness statements, documents, and expert reports, that's a good thing. Um, two exchanges, maybe in some cases one suffices. But in my experience, after one exchange, I'm always frustrated. It's not enough. There must be a reply. And if there is a reply, there must be a rejoinder. Um, we have witnesses and experts examined, examined by counsel. The great idea of cross-examination, that's wonderful. We did not have it. We still do not have it in civil law. So this model is superior to the state predecessors, in my opinion. That's the first advantage. The second is, if we do not have this model, life would be awful. <laughs> because suppose at the beginning of an arbitration, no rule, okay. nothing prepared, we're going to discuss with the parties the best rules. Because the parties need to have rules, need to know where they go and how they will go there. Um, so let's see, for instance, how do you, uh, is direct examination uh, possible or not? How long should it last? Um, Cross-examination, on what topics should it be uh, restricted or should it not be restricted at all, etc., etc. because I could list probably 100 questions. And you have to discuss that with the parties who disagree between themselves because uh, of the interest of one which is different from the interest of the other or because they come from different uh, backgrounds. So it would be a nightmare. That's the reason why I think that I put a question mark. I think it's good to have a model, but it's, it's my conclusion. You must really be ready to derogate from the standard where it is needed to do so. It's good to have a standard, and it's good to have that standard, I think. So, uh, it's an optimistic note. Of the end. May I? Yeah? 
Thank you, Pierre. I, I, I couldn't agree more. And when I was hearing you talk about chaos with the parties of artists, uh, chaos is the word that came to me. Uh, it made me think of my two daughters who are two, uh, three, sorry, now, and five years old. And they, you know, they taught me the benefit of models, standard, routine. When you change that for children, they go, wow. You, like things happen, <laughs> tantrum and stuff you can't imagine. Well, in a way, in an arbitration, is the same. And as an institution, of course, we are part of the reason why there is so much standardization. It's not just a question of mixing cultures and arbitration having uh, sort of generating its own rulings. It's also institutions that have highly contributed to that. But when you think of ICC, uh, of course, as the example I would put forward, um, the work that the ICC court, when it scrutinizes a word, is a very, very metric word, work that resembles uh, uh, is similar in every single case, wherever that case is seated. We had last year arbitration seated in over 100 different cities. But the fact that this ICC court would scrutinize these awards following a similar process, asking arbitral tribunals to look into the same parameters, to look at this very same sort of uh, red uh, spots, red points, or blind corners that might lead to annulment is the reason why ICC awards, when they are presented to domestic courts, will tend to come with, I would say, uh, a, a, a positive uh, a prejudice for them when it comes to enforcement or recognition before uh, national courts. Because they know that they come with that stamp. They know that also during the life of the process, there was this secretariat that was following closely uh, the arbitral tribunal in its work and making sure that the process will respect a certain minimum <laughs> of standards, uh, similar uh, checks, similar balances, and that is uh, the, I would say, the, 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 the biggest advantage of, of a system that is normalized and standardized. So definitely, uh, yes, the question mark, I think, is uh, warranted because too much standardization can also kill creativity. But as long as arbitral tribunals have uh, the opportunity to con constantly go back to parties and make sure that, in, that they adapt the standard to the needs of those specific parties, the standardization cannot be seen as a bad thing. I would simply add one thing from the perspective of aviation engineering, uh, which is this. Uh, great design is simplification. Bad design is additive. And uh, because you like children's books, I think you'll know this one. Yertle the, Yertle the Turtle yes. by Dr. Oh. Seuss. The story of Yertle the Turtle is King Yertle is king of the tiny pond which he surveys. And he decides that he can be king of the world if he stacks up under other little turtles underneath him. And at the very bottom of the stack, there's a turtle named Mac. And uh, my six-year-old loves this part. Little Mac coughs. Yertle falls from his throne and can then only be king over his pond. Let's be the turtle named Mac. <laughs> okay. yeah. I enjoyed that very much. Um, <clears throat> I agree entirely with Pierre that there has to be some kind of starting point. You can't reinvent the wheel for every arbitration. But I do think that the current procedural order that we have does need some attention, including on the topics that I sought to outline and won't repeat. The point that I wanted to pick up is something that Pierre said in reacting to me, with which I very much agree, which is the natural way for arbitrators to exercise greater authority over the proceedings is to do so over time as the proceedings progress and the arbitrators learn more about the case. That has to include, in my opinion, a willingness to revise and refine the procedural rules that govern the arbitration, whether it's by adding new procedural orders or refining the existing ones, to deal with the problems as they come up as the arbitrators get their sleeves further rolled up as they get into the case. Otherwise, we all risk officials of arbitral institutions analogizing uh, parties in their council as three and five-year-old children. <laughs> <laughs> I, 
I'm glad that you said that. Then I was wondering who the toddlers are. Uh, is it the arbitrators, the parties? <laughs> Maybe the other can tell us later on. But let's now actually open this to uh, questions. I know that there were already a couple. Um, I think we're going to keep the microphone. So if you can stand up, say your name, yeah. and very loudly uh, put your question so that everyone can hear you. Good evening. Uh, I'm Taral Jaber. I come from Lebanon. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Rafael and Maxi for organizing this wonderful seminar. Very informative indeed. Uh, thank you very much. And second, allow me to say that I'm honored to meet, finally meet Professor Pierre Meyer. I'm not your direct student, but I'm your indirect student because you were quoted so many times in my PhD thesis at the University of Montpellier 22 <laughs> years back. So uh, I'm honored to meet you finally. Uh, regarding uh, the choice of arbitrators and appointment, as mentioned by uh, Carl, so what you said is very interesting. And allow me to add up one important element, which is the cultural barrier that should be taken into consideration while appointing an arbitrator, whether it was uh, ethnic, uh, religious, uh, language, or territorial because this is something that needs to be taken care of, in addition to what was mentioned by Professor Pierre Meyer regarding the choice of law and the uh, various differences that we might face in a certain case. So, for example, I was uh, sitting in a case as a co-arbitrator in Dubai like two months ago, and one witness, uh, who was an Arab witness, he was examined by a KC, and the guy was a bit offended by the questions although there was nothing in it, so we had to clarify everything. That's why it is very important to have at least uh, one arbitrator in, in a panel of three or more uh, to support the diversity that you have mentioned. So this is point number one. Point number two regarding the limitation of uh, pages or uh, uh, documentation, as you have mentioned, regarding the International Court of Justice or anything else. I don't think limitation by itself is, uh, is needed. The culture behind this is very important that, as you have mentioned, I didn't have time to uh, summarize, so I wrote, uh, uh, it was a bit long. And also regarding the uh, documentation. So uh, 750 documents might be too much or it might be uh, too little because, for example, in one of the construction cases I have been in, we had 21,000 documents. So what's the way or what's the best way to tackle such an issue? The solution was very easy in such a case. The two experts appointed by both parties, they sat together and they took out most of the documents that were in TV. So I think this is a better approach than limiting the pages or not. Thank you very much. I think there's another comment there. Hi, uh, my name is Pierre, I'm from Brazil. Uh, my question is, uh, uh, considering the arbitrators nowadays, we have a lot of fights uh, to constitute the tribunals and so on. So we have uh, several uh, personal attacks for the arbitrators, uh, if they should do or should not do the interpretation and how uh, to avoid those fights, because sometimes those fights are clearly for postpone uh, the, the, the beginning of the arbitration and so on, how to avoid this and how to react to that uh, when you, the tribunal uh, is very, very clear that the strategy is just to postpone. That's my question. Uh, who, who wants to answer for me? It will be nice. Thank you. Yeah, just to clarify, when you talk about fights, what exactly are we talking about? Because they try to qualify the papers to do okay. not start the yeah, as, uh, to see you. So we're talking about potential conflicts of potential interest. Potential conflicts, but, but sometimes it's not a real conflict. Understood. It's just yeah, yeah. Because Understood. Because the arbitration is more and yeah. more aggressive. Understood. That, that's part. interesting that you raise that, if I may. Um, one, one of the, talk about what's wrong in that long list I said to you guys I had about what's wrong with the arbitration. Of course, you know, issues relating to conflict of interest, whether they are actual conflicts or not, uh, are some that I think would deserve, uh, uh, you know, to be part of the 
the conversation here, obviously. Uh, and if we look at what you're talking about, meaning those situations where the, the issue or the facts that are re uh, disclosed by an arbitrator are not qualified enough to warrant uh, a disqualification from the panel, but yet would give rise to an entire uh, procedure in and of itself on the independence or impartiality of the arbitrator, obviously, uh, are issues from the institution perspective that are uh, first top on our agenda, but problematic, obviously. I think that uh, there, there are different ways to approach that. I believe that we are seeing more and more arbitrators, to be very honest, doing useless disclosures. That's my view. That's what I've experienced as a, as a case manager. And those useless disclosures, they put everybody in trouble mm -hmm. because they, they are creating, and, and I know that some American colleagues have very different views on that, but they're creating this new standard of how far you go in terms of what you express to the parties. And that party in that particular case will get your disclosure. And then when they go off to another case, we'll expect that same degree of disclosure from an arbitrator. And if disclosure doesn't happen, would of course raise that as an issue to challenge the arbitrator from the panel, whether or not that issue is uh, sufficiently problematic to warrant the arbitrator being, uh, being, not being confirmed in the case. So I think that we need to be, uh, as, as, a, as a community, we need to actually have those conversation about how far do we go in disclosing. That said, we also have the problem of people not putting on the table what they should put on the table. And, uh, you know, we've had recent examples Examples at ICC, including in, in one of my former cases where we saw an, uh, an unfortunate annulment of an award uh, because of the behavior of an arbitrator. And when that happens as an institution, you're always thinking, well, you know, uh, should, it ha sh should we have done more? Should this have happened or not? The, at the end of the day, uh, the way we look at this is if, uh, at least as an institution again, if the uh, facts and circumstances that are being debated in terms of the potential conflict of the arbitrator will not have any, or, or in our assessment, will not have any assess, uh, impact on the decision making of the arbitrator, uh, that the arbitrator will not derive any form of benefit from it, we would tend to err uh, in favor of letting the arbitrator, the arbitrator uh, uh, being a, a part of the panel. Of course, we know that some parties will, from that moment on, uh, have one party, the one losing on the challenge, will have a form of frustration, and that can follow during the whole life of the case. But again, coming back to due process paranoia, that does not mean that the award will not survive. And at the end of the day, this whole exercise is about rendering an award that will be enforceable at law. That's the only, uh, I would say, guiding principle that we should all bear in mind all through these exercises. I don't know if it really answers your question, but this, these are some of my thoughts about this. Hi, uh, uh, Eric Ng from Hong Kong. Um, we've heard today comments in relation to arbitrator selection and the ability, for example, of parties to derail or fight over arbitrators with issues of deep process paranoia in relation to complaints which are made in relation to the arbitrator's potential conduct and also uh, other aspects. And I noted that for institutions, there's a vested interest in making sure that proceedings are done in an efficient manner. And there are now statutory or uh, sta uh, statements in the rules, such as the ICC rules, uh, that require an arbitrator to conduct proceedings in an efficient uh, and productive manner. But there's no such statement in the rules, and there's no such statutory obligations for parties to conduct proceedings in an efficient manner once they have entered into an arbitration agreement. I'm just wondering if that might be something which might be able to help resolve some of the issues that we're seeing with arbitration today. Because in a lot of ways, we have two sides of the triangle who have a vested interest, uh, or at least a, an obligation, to render uh, efficient proceedings. But then you have one side of the triangle that's not. And it really does seem to be at the core of a lot of the issues that we're talking about today. Hi, Eric. Uh, the 
I think I agree with the notion of what you're saying, but I don't think it's strictly necessary. And I'm going to quote my good friend Michael McElrath's evidence for this. Uh, Michael, for many years, has had a simple experiment that he runs, that he takes a microphone and puts it in the face of uh, everyone he meets. And he asks arbitrators, how long should it take? 18 to 24 months. And he asks counsels, how long should it take? 12 to 18 months. And he asks, uh, asks in-house counsel, how long should it take? 6 to 12 months. <laughs> and then he asks business people, how long should it take? three weeks. <laughs> so we're subject to a law that is unwritten but clear. And uh, my favorite example of that is that uh, when I sent away two of uh, one of my business guys to go negotiate uh, with uh, the woman who represented the other party, uh, they came back with an arbitration agreement that, uh, that uh, obligated the ICC to settle their dispute in three months. <laughs> it was troubling for me to have to explain to them that the ICC was under no such obligation and they should be under no illusion that that was actually going to happen. So I, I like the spirit of that idea, but I don't need it because that's what my bonus depends on. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just add one point? Actually, the truth is there is there is a code of conduct for parties, and that is money. At the end of the day, the, at least under ICC rules, the behavior of the Council of Parties will have an impact at the end of the case in terms of who will bear the cost. And I can, I'm sure Pierre will join me in the fact that uh, when a party is being particularly, you know, uh, expressive in the guerrilla tactics, they do pay the bill at the end of the case, even when they're are winning on the merits. We've seen those cases. So yes, there is a policing system. Might not be the best, but the wallet is actually quite efficient. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with you. Um, problem is that in very, very big cases, the costs are minimal. Yeah. They don't care. Absolutely don't they care. They can it's kill true. the arbitration at the risk of having all the costs on them. So we do it. Yes, that's true. That's a very good point. <laughs> Those cases are depressing. <laughs> it's, of course, entirely possible for parties to agree by contract, including with the arbitrator in the terms of reference, that the arbitration will be over within a certain period of time. And that has mm -hmm. happened and it does work. Council hate it, arbitrators hate it. But if that's what the rules are by contract, when they sign up, everyone knows where they stand. Uh, and for my part, I'm surprised that doesn't happen more often, driven by the business people. Mm -hmm. Two more questions. If there are questions. If there are questions. Yes. Hi, I'm 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 Gordon Miron, and I'm an associate here at Decathlon Paris. Um, and I had a question in relation to the points we made about uh, uh, exchange of submissions being too lengthy and not necessarily necessary to have two rounds. Um, which is what do you think of uh, the adoption sometimes and arbitration proceedings of uh, the French litigation practice of uh, conclusion capitulative, which is basically when the second memorial of a party is basically the, based on the first round memorial of the same party, but amended uh, to basically summarize both submissions into one, uh, so that basically the tribunal may read only the second round submission, which summarizes both submissions. It's a practice which happens sometimes in arbitration, not very common. Um, and I was wondering, what was your opinion on, on that? If it makes it more efficient, or or if you actually don't dislike it? Uh, ben, ben has so ben, thoughts about ben, that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ben, so I think it already happens informally all the time because second round submissions all the time are regurgitating everything that's in the first one and then responding to the second. So the real problem. Uh, is not whether or not it should, it should happen in the sense of adding something. The real problem is whether or not it should happen in terms of it not happening <laughs> as it currently is now informally. Uh, I don't have any view about that in the abstract. There might be some cases for some arbitrators where it's useful because they can just honestly say, I'm only going to read one thing, so put it all in the last one. And I would rather that that happened than it to be unsure whether or not it goes through. My own view, and you might say I'm, I would say this because it's not a tradition uh, with which I'm particularly familiar, although I have done it, uh, is that it's not the most effective way for a dispute to be decided and that it's better to see the development of the dispute step by step so that it can be resolved following that debate. Uh, and it in many ways eliminates the debate and that's harder than I think to reach a better decision. 
So I'm not in principle for it, uh, but it, there might be cases with particular parties, particular arbitrators and particular issues uh, where it's uh, sensible. But my main point is we should just be clear about whether that's what's happening or not, because the worst scenario is where it's not supposed to happen, but it happens anyway, and that's a very significant proportion of current cases. I don't have much experience of that, but I've seen that in two cases, and it, it worked perfectly well. And of course, in the second uh, memorial, uh, you have to flag what is new, of course, by a different color, for instance, or any, any manner, in any manner. Uh, I, I'm told that in some fields, it must absolutely be avoided. But uh, I don't know which fields there are, but probably in these fields, that, that doesn't happen. Last question. We have one last. Oh, yeah. We will be the last one. Make it quick. <laughs> yeah, I'm mindful of the time. Uh, hello, my name is Vlad. I'm at uh, the Science Po LM in Transnational Arbitration and Dispute Settlement. Uh, my question is with respect to the causes of uh, due process paranoia. But we speak that we say a lot that arbitrators are taking much more time with uh, settling issues just because they're afraid that the award would be challenged. But then the award is challenged by by the people in this very room, probably the council, and they are advised by the uh, people who work in house. So the question is. Um, should we maybe take more responsibility to bring more good faith challenges and maybe advise our clients more not to bring unnecessary challenges to kind of help arbitrators deal with due process paranoia? Again, it's a, uh, I understand that it's a very, let's say, um, theoretical question because our duty as counsel is not to the arbitration community as a whole, but to the client in the present case. So is there a balance to be found between those things? May I actually suggest that we take the other question as really the last one, and then we let you answer both of them together. Marva Kings, to you, Tanya. I enjoyed your, your reflections across the board, but I found especially interesting the points about diversity in arbitration. And I'm wondering if you could say a few words about how you strike the right balance of diversity when part of the very essence of arbitration is bias. If you were to appoint a panel of a pilot, a brain surgeon, and a pianist, you lose the cultural fluency, the linguistic fluency, the industry fluency, perhaps in favor of neutrality, but also the fluency with the various models that characterize the modern practice of arbitration. So how do you strike that? How do you get the benefit without the detriment of being an overly biased group? Thank you. Do you want to start with this one? Sure. Okay. At the risk of disappointing you, I want to violently disagree with your premise. <laughs> Let's not talk about arbitral tribunals, let's talk about air crews. So uh, Korean Airlines used to have the absolute worst safety record on the planet. Uh, they addressed that by essentially introducing something that broke the cultural affinity between the air crew. They brought in a very aggressive Canadian safety manager who insisted in breaking the cultural affinity within air crews so that each the pilot and the co-pilot would feel safe in speaking up when they identified a problem. I would each and every time appoint a pilot, a pianist, and a pediatrician over three pilots, even in an aviation case. And I will tell you that the two single worst results, not because I thought that the result was bad for my client, but because the decision made no sense and I struggled to explain it to my internal clients who were outraged by it and immediately went right, right back to arguing with the party uh, on the other side of it, were in cases where my counsel had managed to convince me to appoint three QCs who were court of appeal judges or similar from within the same cultural affinity on a case of English law. There is one rule that I make everyone follow. There will be a diverse tribunal. 
every single time, and it will be a diverse tribunal that we will construct by virtue of the most diverse perspectives we can achieve, however we can achieve it. Uh, yeah, I, I think it could be the last one. I just want one comment on the question with respect to uh, challenges to uh, uh, arbitral awards. Uh, we talk a lot about those challenges. The truth is most awards are actually enforced. Uh, we talk about uh, what doesn't go right, and that's why we're here today. Uh, but when you say, well, you know, the people in this room are those making the challenge, and the grounds that they use maybe sometimes are not so valid, uh, the truth is people do the triage, I think. And I think that uh, council advise their clients and most awards are voluntarily complied with. Uh, otherwise, we would read, read much more <laughs> about cases not uh, be, being either challenged or not being enforced. Uh, there are challenges to awards that are made on frivolous uh, basis. Um, in most serious jurisdictions, they will not prosper. Uh, in most serious jurisdictions. Sometimes we do have a few surprises where we all wake up in the morning and read GAR and feel like, what happened? <laughs> uh, but uh, just to say that, I, yeah, I don't think that there are that many of those frivolous challenges to awards. To arbitrators, it's different, but to awards, I don't think there are that many. I just want to add, today, Korean Airlines has one of the best safety records. <laughs> <laughs> So I think, unfortunately, we're running out of time for more questions, but we will have the opportunity over wine and cheese to continue the discussion. Um, but before that, a couple of final remarks. I think Rafael and I are absolutely uh, delighted. And really, um, the hopes that we had with this panel are totally blown um, into the sky. We, are, we, we wouldn't have hoped for any better discussion. So um, please join me in thanking all our wonderful panelists. Thank um, my colleagues at Queen Mary, Anna Gray, and Samantha Heffernan, who've actually supported this event. Uh, so thank you very much to uh, both of them. Thank you.